Welcome to Dive In With Dot. We're going to be exploring um, an area that I think is of interest to a lot of people who practice inquiry. And that is something to do with the inner critic. And one of the kind of nuances that I have noticed, I've noticed as a, a kind of stumbling block, as a place that people can be unclear about what to do. So that's what we're going to be talking about this evening, this very interesting and very important uh, topic. So let's just have a quick look around. Anyone new? If you're new, first time here, just raise your hand. Just kind of wave. Okay, I see Gail, I see Lucy. Okay, oh yeah, there's Ashok. Hi, oh, Mayavati, welcome. All right, I'm on the second screen, might have missed some people there. Okay, great. So, you know, Diving with Dom is a public forum, right? So it's really part of my effort to make the, just raise awareness really of the practice of inquiry. So it's really dedicated to this, this really beautiful and just incredibly valuable practice. And um, we record the sessions, so it's a kind of public forum, so anybody can show up here. And we record the sessions and we uh, generally make the sessions available on, our, on the Dive In Inquiry YouTube channel. So if you want to go and see past sessions, you can go and um, view them there. Um, we will do a little uh, practice and then some discussion and teaching. And then you will get to do a little exercise if you want to. And that'll happen in a breakout room um, with another person. And just so you know, that part is not recorded, right? So it's not recorded at all. And that part is confidential. So, um, you know, if you want to hold it in that way. Um, and at the same time, you know, as I say, anybody could be on this call. So you want to participate um, accordingly. There are people here of all different experience levels, right? People who are brand new to inquiry and people who have been inquiring for many decades. So uh, that's part of the richness of the forum and the opportunity to learn from each other. And hopefully, hopefully some of what I say will be useful, you know, regardless of your skill level and your experience level. Um, if you have questions or suggestions around Dive In With Dom or other topics that you'd like to see, um, please feel free to be in touch. So I'd love to hear from you uh, if you have uh, um, thoughts or feedback or anything along that line. You're always very welcome to be in touch. So we're going to begin um, with a short practice. So we'll do a little meditation. And I'm going to invite you to find a, a comfortable sitting position for your meditation. And um, just begin remembering, remembering that orientation of friendly interest, right? Something so fundamental to inquiry that we're approaching our inner world, approaching our the whole inner world of our thoughts and our feelings and our sensations, our very beingness itself, with, with interest, with curiosity, and with a, a gentleness and a kindness and an attunement for what we might find. And begin sensing the sensations of your body. So take a moment to feel your feet on the ground. Right, actually sensing the sensations of your feet. And it kind of really brings us into the moment. And sense your butt on the chair, in your seat. Check your posture. So feel how your spine is poised above your pelvis. So it rises up, not tense, not collapsing, but with its natural curve, your head resting atop your spine. You can gently close your eyes. <sighs> Take a breath. Nice breath in and out. Relax your jaw. And take a moment as we begin to just notice how you're feeling, where you're at this moment of your day, whatever it is. How's your mind? Is it busy or quiet? 
nothing right or wrong, just as it is, just to be aware. How's your body feeling? And then let your attention, your felt sense attention, come down to your lower belly, so that area below your belly button. And you can rest one hand over it and cup the other hand over that, if you like. And just begin to sense the actual sensations of this lower belly area. So you might feel the warmth of your hand. Maybe the movement of your belly wall as you breathe. You might feel some kind of energy there, tingling. Maybe there's some anxiety in the pit of your belly. And maybe you feel some kind of presence, if you know what that is. Some sense of consciousness, something that feels like it's there, like something you can touch, maybe a point of presence, a sense of solidity, or density, or fluidity. So you don't have to make yourself feel anything that's not there. You're just letting yourself sense into whatever it is you find in your lower belly. And so we're going to do a little concentration practice where we just sit and stay close to that sensation. So the sensation may change, may all kinds of things can happen, or not much can happen at all. And whatever happens is fine. You're just practicing placing your attention there, staying in touch. And you can let go of all the rest. So everything else going on in your inner world, it's all fine. You can let it be. And for these few minutes, you're just sensing the sensations of your lower belly.
And if your attention is wandering, just notice that and see if you can bring it back to sensing your lower belly. And then with your next breath, you can let go of the focus of the concentration. Let your awareness begin to open up, opening to the whole field of your experience. Whatever you begin to get in touch with. You may notice sensations in your body sounds around you. You may notice how you're feeling, the sort of feeling state, emotional state of your experience. You may notice thoughts in your mind. You might be aware of your consciousness itself, some kind of presence, spaciousness, delight, curiosity, kindness, vitality, whatever you're in touch with. So how is it to just be open to whatever you find? To notice each thing and to kind of respond with a sort of curiosity, like, oh, there's that feeling, there's that sensation. You know what that is. Open to it, I kind of welcome it, curious about it. And see, how much is that present? And how much are there other things, other kind of reactions, like you look at something and you think, oh, don't want that. Can't believe I'm still feeling that. Why aren't I feeling more awake this morning? And that kind of commentary. Some sort of judgment of the experience. So you can just 
be aware, oh, is that going on? Is there some of that present? And then notice, how are you feeling about having this experience? Like, is it okay with you? Are you okay to be where you are? Just as it is. may not be your favorite thing, but is it okay? Can you be with it? Or are you, is there some part of you really feeling like, uh-uh, this is not good. I, I, I don't want this to be here. Well, this shouldn't be here. I should be experiencing something else. So just to notice, just to begin peeking in the direction of what we'll be exploring today. And when you're ready to, you can let your eyes open. Include the sensations of your arms and legs. And sense your arms and legs and look and listen, consciously listening. So our topic this evening is related to the inner critic. And depending on your background and experience and orientation, the inner critic is something that you may have, you know, different ways of approaching and working with. So it may be completely new to you. You may not know what that is, right? And so we'll talk briefly about what it is and how it shows up. You may have an approach from something like mindfulness, right? Maybe it's something you try to bring compassion to, and that's a practice you know. And you may have heard in the diamond approach about something like defending against your inner. And you may have tried that with varying degrees of success. And you may have found experiences that seem to just kind of hang around anyway. Right? You may have tried out that defending thing and you're not totally convinced that it works and you're not really sure what to do about it. And maybe you've been on the path for, you know, a long time, for many years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And this thing, the superego, just kind of seems to, something seems to hang around in a way that doesn't seem to change and that mm, defending against doesn't seem to work. So we want to understand a little more clearly what's going on here and to discriminate a couple of experiences that I think get mixed up. And so it's all under the banner of when is the superego, when is what we're calling the superego actually not the superego? When is it something else? Right. And this turns out to have quite significant implications for how we work with it, how we practice with it. So what is the inner critic, the superego? Let's quickly touch on that. So the inner critic manifests typically in uh, sort of feelings and thoughts that what you're doing or feeling or experiencing, some element of your experience or have done uh, something that you did is not okay, right? Is not right, that it shouldn't be like that, that that's not what we should be going on. And you end up feeling bad about your experience in some kind of way. You might feel guilty about it. You might feel ashamed of it. You feel sort of like it's less than or worse. And it would be better if you had some other kind of experience happening. So the superego or inner critic is a really vital, um, let's say, phenomena to uh, get to grips with in the journey of inquiry. Because 
if inquiry means diving into your experience, entering into the fullness of your experience, being with it in as open and interested and curious and friendly a way as you can be, so that you can learn about it, so that you can find out what is actually there, what is really true, what is really true for you, right? what is really going on within your inner world and what's making it happen. If there is any force that is pushing you away from that, right, that's going to limit and shut down your inquiry. And if every time you approach certain experience that you're having, and there's some sort of voice in your head going, oh, what's wrong with you? Why the hell are you still feeling like that? You know, it's, it's not really conducive to a, a sort of open, rich, um, enjoyable inquiry experience. So it's something that we have to recognize. Right? It has this particular function. And its job is to kind of keep us within the bounds of what is familiar or of what we have learned so far is familiar and okay and that was compatible with the general conditions uh, in which we grew up and the general conditions that we've developed to be okay with. Right? So it kind of enforces those conditions. I described it in diving in the inner ocean as a bit like the Coast Guard, right? So you go swimming, and as long as you go swimming in the familiar pool of where it's okay, and you know it's safe, and you explore that little patch of territory, as long as you're there, everything's fine. But the minute you start going outside of that familiar zone, into something new or different or unfamiliar, the inner critic is going to come up. It's like the Coast Guard, the lifeguard. It starts blowing the whistle, telling you to get out the water, telling you this is not where you should be going. Now, the practice of inquiry is by definition at some point, maybe not at the beginning, but at some point it's going to run into this structure, into this, uh, uh, this phenomenon. Because in inquiry you are exploring your inner world. And the more you bring it into consciousness, the more you get in touch with your feelings and your beliefs, and it starts getting you in touch with your history, and, and then getting you in touch with essence and your presence and deficiencies, all the things we find in the inner world, right? A lot of that is totally outside what the inner critic thinks is okay. So it's gonna keep trying to corral you back into that limited safe zone. And the way that it shows up then is as those kind of feelings. You feel bad, you feel it's not okay, you shouldn't be experiencing what you're experiencing, you shouldn't be feeling so sad, what's wrong with you, how are you still feeling sad? Look, you're feeling like a kid now, how can you be feeling like a little child? You're supposed to be a grown-up, why don't you pull yourself mm -hmm. together? Right? Or what's going on with you, now you're feeling all weak and deficient, that's so deficient. pathetic. Uh, let's just mute everyone. Uh, someone's not muted there. Um, so if you are um, exploring something, like maybe something difficult begins to show up and your inner critic goes like, no, 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 get rid of that experience. You shouldn't be feeling that. It comes up around positive experiences. Next thing you know, you're feeling all of this joy and freedom. And it's like, yeah, well, you better look out for that. Don't get too big for your boots. Right? Or don't be too free, you're not going to, how are you going to live your life if you're just feeling so much joy and freedom? Right? So it kind of limits and constricts our experience, all different kinds of experience uh, in different ways. So one of the things at some point is we have to begin to be, well, not we have to, I mean, we begin to become conscious of this phenomenon, right? That there you are just trying to be where you are and explore where you are, and something starts jumping on you and making you feel bad about it. Initially, we, we don't see it as an external force for many people. You just don't find yourself talking to yourself. You're like, oh, I can't believe I'm still doing this. What the hell is wrong with me? Right? It can have that sort of a, a flavor to it. 
And what we learn is to recognize that it is in our psyche, it operates like a kind of an external voice. So it becomes useful to think of it as, a, as a, an external force that is kind of talking to us, um, giving us advice, nudging us this way and that way, telling us that we shouldn't be like that or like that or like that, but occasionally give us, giving us a pat on the back if we seem to be doing okay. So as I say, if inquiry is about diving in and exploring your inner world, in a certain sense, the inner critic is like the big barrier or one of the primary barriers that sort of stops us, just stops us from entering into whatever is happening in an open and curious and friendly way to find out about it. Because there's something in you going, oh God, I can't believe I'm doing this again, or I can't believe this is happening again, or I can't believe I'm feeling this way. What's wrong with me? Why am I feeling this way? So this is the kind of basic phenomenon. And if you inquire, look around the room, I see lots of <laughs> inquirers here, you probably have some sense of what I'm talking about. So that's what it is. How do we deal with it? Well, it turns out we have to go through quite a process with it. And really, because a lot of the time for many people, when they first begin to recognize it, that they think of it as their friend. It's like trying to keep them safe, it's giving them good advice. That's the voice they listen to half the time. Sometimes shows up as a voice sort of in your right ear, sitting on your right shoulder, and you listen to this voice and it says, no, do this, do that, you know, and it seems to direct you around in a way that kind of looks like it might be helpful. You know, it's trying to look after you in some kind of way. So we have to keep bringing it into consciousness, recognizing what it's saying to us, what the implied message is, because even if there isn't a voice there, there's an implied message. There's a feeling, there's something that makes you feel, oh, this is wrong. I shouldn't be having this experience. So in a certain way, the way I think about it, like one of the fundamental questions you can ask yourself to sort of litmus test, is my superego active? Is you can ask yourself, is it okay for me to be experiencing this? Can I be experiencing what I'm experiencing? Is it a, is, does that feel okay? Can I be here and explore it? it? May not be my favorite experience, but can I be here with it and explore it? Or am I feeling that this is really wrong and shouldn't be here and I'm messing up in some fundamental way. If you're feeling that way, then odds are your superego has actually got you, right? Then you're actually in the clutches of that structure. So we have to go through a process with that. We have to begin to recognize it, feel how it affects us, and the more we feel it, the more we recognize it, the more our inner world expands, the more we begin to see that it is restricting us, that it is keeping us limited, and that, in fact, it is doing so with some kind of aggression, right? That when we even let ourselves become the superego in relation to ourselves, we feel like we want to squash ourselves down, and it's like, you don't, don't you go there, you stupid person, what's wrong with you? So it has that kind of judgmental and attacking tone that you know, might not be apparent at first. So we've got to bring this into consciousness. We've got to feel the effects of it. And at a certain point, as I also discuss in the book, there are certain responses that tend to start happening in us. Like the more you hear that message, oh, what the hell is wrong with you? Why are you feeling like that? How can you be so pathetic? Right? At some point, something in you goes, well, like, how does that affect me? Like, feels really horrible. I really don't like that, right? I actually just wish that voice would shut up, yeah? And so at some point, our natural aggression and strength and expansion will begin to show up to start pushing this barrier off, right? So we start going like, just get out of here. I don't care if you like what I'm experiencing or not. I want to be with what's here. 
right? I want to explore what's going on here, and I don't want to be made to feel bad about it. I don't want some kind of voice in my head, whether it's my mother's voice or anyone else, kind of giving me a hard time about what's going on. And that movement, right, that mobilization of our strength and aggression that makes us go, back off, get off me. Right? That is the natural beginning of what we call defending against the superego. So at that point, there is a natural unfolding, a development in our consciousness um, to go to, to respond in a way that begins to free us from it. And the more we recognize the limitation and the hurt and the difficulty of it, the more something in us wants to be free from it. Right. So that's a very important step. And it's a step that I think, uh, in a way, can't be shortcut. So you can hear about being taught to defend against your superego, but until you've really gone through that process of feeling the constriction of it, feeling the attack of it, and feeling how that limits you and hurts you and does all sorts of things to you, until you've really got to that point, that natural strength that goes, get off me, won't really arise. So until that point, really, our practice is to just keep bringing the superego into consciousness. You've got to keep being aware of it, feeling what it does, feeling the impact of it, and allowing yourself to, little by little, find that response, find some kind of response. That process of disengaging through, uh, from it then goes through a whole development and refinement. And over time, at some point, you know, deeper into the journey, oftentimes simply recognizing there's an attack or there's the presence of the superego will be enough to actually disengage from it. So it just doesn't hook us in quite the same way. Right? So that's a, a whole process that tends to happen over many years, that it becomes easier and easier to, you know, as soon as you recognize there's some kind of judgment going on, you're able to, uh, well, just the recognition itself is enough to unhook the power of the judgment. So that's something, if you've been inquiring for a long time, you could reflect on, like, where are you in that process? You know, do you, do you still not feel you've got disengaging from it? Like, like telling it to get out of your hair and leave you alone? Are you still finding your way to that? Or, you know, are you at the point where maybe it takes a bit more work, like a bit of engagement with it, and then some more inquiry to begin to loosen it up? Or are you at that point where you simply recognize it, and oftentimes that's enough um, to free you up? Now, where it gets interesting, <laughs> even more interesting, is that there are many things in our inner world, right, that can make you feel bad. The superego is not the only thing that can make you feel bad, right? So there are experiences of feeling rejected, right? Like you feel rejected by someone or something, right? And these have very deep roots in our psyche. There are experiences of feeling like you want something and it's not possible. Right? That can also make you feel bad in a, a whole different kind of way. Right? So there are various structures that are part of our ego structure, part of our personality structure, that will come to light over time as you dive deeper and deeper into your inner world. These will begin to surface. Right? And Many of them have very difficult, challenging, uncomfortable feelings in them, right? And are, they are very interesting doorways and portals uh, to explore. But they can be easily mixed up with inquiry. I mean, with inquiry, with the superego, right? They can be easily mixed up with the superego. And if you have studied, if you are aware of some of these structures, things like a rejecting object relation or an anti libidinal object relation, Right? So in a rejecting object relation, there's a sense of you, 
there's a sense of somebody else, and there's the feeling that they're rejecting you, right? Or maybe there's the feeling that you're rejecting them. You look at them and you just feel this rejection and hatred and you, you just want to vanish them away, right? That's a structure we can get in touch with. People get into that structure, I hear, I have heard many times, and they think, oh, it's just my superego, I'm judging them. Right? I'm judging that other person, I'm acting out my superego, I need to stop it. Right? As opposed to, oh wow, there's some kind of structure here where I'm feeling all of this hatred and rejection, and mm, there's something to explore there, there's something to open to. There's something to find out about. There's this deep structure that I've got to find out about. Right? Something going on in my inner world. So, the more we learn about different kinds of structures and encounter them, some people can, it can get, I remember myself being very confused for quite a while about, well, is it superego? Is it like a rejecting object? How do I tell the difference? What am I supposed to do differently with them? You know, am I just sitting here being my superego all over again? in a way that's not helpful. It's also interesting, it was something I noticed in my own inquiry, like so the one time I'm sitting there inquiring, and I notice, oh, my superego is up about this. That's interesting, because I hadn't been feeling much superego for a while, and there it was, like on my shoulder. So I kind of let it be there. I'm like, okay, hey buddy, there you are. Yeah, 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 what you got to say? Right? And then I, I kind of went over here, and I was my superego, and I was like, yeah, you better, how can you, anyway, I let my, my superego kind of give it to me, and then I came back over here, and I sort of fell into it, and I felt all, got all small, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh. and then at some point, I could begin to feel, here I felt all kind of, there was something very young, and small, and little, and on this side, and over here was something that felt really mean and attacking and kind of vicious and all of that. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's a rejecting object relation, right? So now I'm actually in an object relation. I'm exploring a structure in my inner world. And yet it had started off looking like superego, right? Like a judgment. So what was it that made the difference? How to approach them differently? How do I work with this in a useful way? And what I realized is that at the beginning, the superego, the part of the structure that is the superego, was the part that was making me, me, as my kind of familiar sense of self, it was making me feel bad about what was arising in the experience, right? So I was feeling, oh God, I shouldn't be still dealing with this. This should have been done by now. So I was feeling bad about it. And that was superego, right? But as I continued exploring, at a certain point, I was into some kind of parent-child object relation. And the interesting thing was that I noticed at that point that I no longer felt bad about it. I wasn't feel ba feeling bad about exploring the experience that was arising. The experience that was arising could be there. It was a difficult, painful experience, right? That involved a lot of aggression and, you know, hatred and rejection and feeling small and helpless on the other side of it. But, I did not have a problem with it being there. I could be there with it. I could enter into those different uh, experiences and it was fine with me, right? And so that, I think, in a sense, kind of highlights the difference between what is a pure superego experience, right? And what is the experience of something that is part of your ego structure, part of the structure of your inner world that really just needs more inquiry? And that is that the superego, 
acts on, in a sense, you. Right? It's what acts on you as the one inquiring, as the one exploring, as the one being in your experience. And it makes you feel bad about it. The judgment, in a sense, is of you in such a way that you are left feeling that whatever the experience is, you're bad, you're deficient, you're wrong because it's happening. Right? So the judgment in the attack is actually landing in your central sense of self. If it's successful, it will push you away from it, right? To the extent that you'll be like, oh, okay, I need to not be feeling this. And, you know, and you'll, you'll get away from it in some way. If it's not successful, if you can defend against it or not get caught in it, then some part of you will be able to go, okay, actually, no, I'm, I want to be with this experience, whatever it is. Right? And then you can continue exploring it. And at that point, you might start to feel, oh, there's something young here, or there's something deficient, and some whole structure begins to open up. And at that point, what you have to do, really, is to continue exploring it. Right? If it's not discouraging you from the inquiry, if it is not chasing you away from the inquiry, or from your experience, then you are sitting with something that you can inquire into, you can explore. And then I would say your superego has not got you. So whatever thing you're feeling at that point, whatever it is that's showing up, even if it's uncomfortable or aggressive or whatever it is, if you're okay for it to be there, and you're okay to be with it and to explore it, then it's not your superego then you are not really dealing with the inner critic. Then you are dealing more with something at a deeper level. And in that case, it's always about inquiring into it. Uh, you just want to explore into, oh, what is this big mean thing, if that's what it feels like, right? Or what is this little tiny sort of something that I experience myself to be? Like then you're really getting into some deep diving. And of course, that opens us up to the whole world of object relations. And I'm happy to say that uh, if that sounds vaguely intriguing to you, then we're going to be doing some diving with Doms on uh, object relations in the not too distant future. Uh, in a sense, then we are exploring the actual structures of the inner world. So Freud, the way Freud conceived of the superego, he used what he called a topographical model. And it's like the superego is sort of the bit on the top, right, that kind of enforces the whole thing. And then the actual ego structure is under, sits underneath it. And in that experience that I had, I kind of understood, oh, that's sort of what that means. Like the superego is the bit that acts on you, on your feeling of yourself to make you feel to nudge you towards or away from elements of your experience. That's what the inner critic does, right? Underneath that, there are all of these ego structures, right? And those, those we inquire into like we inquire into anything else. In a certain way, the superego we also inquire into like we inquire into anything else. And it is more that when we recognize what it's doing, we recognize, oh, it's trying to push me away from something that's going on here. The more experienced we become with that, the more we just don't want it to do that. Right? There's something in us develops and becomes stronger to stay with our experience, to not be pushed away from it. And then we get to explore what it is, right? whatever it might be, whatever might be showing up in your own world. So the practice of inquiry has this radical kind of openness, radical openness to whatever is there for you. Because we recognize that everything that's there is like, they're like the breadcrumbs of a treasure trail. And if you can follow them all the way through, right, they will lead to all kinds of astonishing places. 
And mostly we explore them because it's what's there, right? If you're just honest about it, it's like, that's what's showing up. So, you know, what else are you gonna do? <laughs> right. So, I've said a few things about this. I realize as I'm reflecting here that in a certain way it's quite a, this is quite a sort of subtle thing we're talking about here. I think it's really when you've got a lot of experience with your superego and recognizing it, that it becomes important to be able to distinguish where there is judgment that is pushing you away from your experience from where there is like some kind of structure that you need to explore. Right? Because some of those structures really feel like that. Like you can really feel, you feel yourself as like hateful and rejecting. And I remember one student of mine would sit in, sit in small group and he'd be inquiring and he'd just feel like he hated everyone in the room and he hated them and he was rejecting them. And he thought it was his superego the whole time, but it wasn't. Right? That was some particular kind of structure that actually needed to be with, to be with and to open up and to explore, to find out where it's coming from. It's not a problematic thing. Yeah. yeah. So, I, 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 I don't know if that's useful. I hope that is. I hope it can, in a sense, help you to become a little more fine in picking out um, what specifically is the superego. It's a very particular thing. And like I said, to go back to that litmus test, right? The litmus test is, am I okay to be exploring what's here, right? Am, am I, as I'm inquiring, as I'm exploring, like, is this okay? Or am I feeling that it shouldn't be here, that there's something either wrong with me or wrong with my experience or bad or all of those things about what's arising. And if that's the case, if that's arising in such a way that it kind of wants to make you go away from the experience, then it's really good to kind of look into that, to look into the superego, to see what is the message, what's the judgment, what's it attacking you about, and to kind of explore further from there. So, I want to give you just a little chance to sort of look into this for yourselves. And I realize everybody may be in very different places with this. So you're just going to be in groups of two. Right? Susan, we're going to pop you into a group of two. And each person will have five minutes. Right? Just to just look into your experience of the inner critic, right? And of dealing with it and see if you can if you can see in your experience um, things that are specifically in a critic that you can recognize, oh yeah, that's where my superego is up, that's what it's like, and things that may not be, right? Where there might be difficult or negative or challenging kind of feelings, but where it's actually okay to, um, to be with them. Just see if you happen to notice that in your own inquiry. And you know, if you're totally new to inquiry, you can just look into this, you know, this phenomenon, the uh, phenomenon of the inner critic. You know, is it something that you recognize? Is it something that you have experienced? Like, what, what do you do with it? How, how does it affect you? Um, what is your understanding of it? So you just want to look into your experience with it a bit. Okay, so that's going to be five minutes. One person will have five minutes, other person will have five minutes. Um, and then we'll, we'll come right back and we'll have more of a discussion sort of collectively here. Um, so we'll add on an extra five minutes so that you know you have time to say hello and greet each other and maybe nip to the bathroom if you need to do that. Um, so we'll all be back in this room um, to continue at, at 8.35. And just a reminder that if somebody, uh, if you're the person doing the inquiry, you just explore and you're doing the exploration purely for your own benefit, just to find out something interesting for yourself. You, you don't have to explain yourself to your partner. And if you're listening, you wanna just listen. 
right? Don't say anything, don't intervene or advise or therapize or comment or nothing. You just want to sit there and listen to them, hear, hear somebody else's experience. And if you notice yourself getting judgy about what they're saying, well, then you can notice your own inner critic kind of coming up a bit there and get interested in that. So five minutes each, um, you time yourselves and we'll be back here at uh, 25 to the next hour. All right, enjoy. If you're not going to do the exercise, then please drop off the call. You can always come back in 15 minutes, but that way Susan doesn't lump you into an exercise room with somebody and then they get left stranded. So if you're going to not do the exercise, drop off the call now. So oh, welcome back, back to the beach after a short little dive. And yeah, I'm curious, I'm curious what questions you have or anything to share. <clears throat> yeah, Caroline, go ahead. So if you have a question or something you'd like to ask, yeah, Susan said, just raise your electronic hand. Um, so go ahead. Um the super, I mean, this is really, really interesting to me, very intriguing, um, but it feels like like a subtle difference, at least because I'm kind of new into the process. I just think for just a split second, I can get it and then it disappears. And I'm like, oh, I see what he's saying. And then psh, it's gone. Different discerning between the two. Um, yeah. But this is, the superego, it seems to me that superego can be a liar. Can the superego be a liar? Mm -hmm. Say, so what do you mean? Well, can we try to convince me to not, if, if I'm if I'm inquiring and something very painful comes up, to try to convince me. And, you know, having a voice, to be, I'm just looking out for you, you uh -huh. know, I'm just, don't go there because, you know, I'm just looking out for you. I'm trying to be the wise, good parent. Oh, darling, you know, oh, that's too, it's okay. I mean, is it, it seems to me that that could come up. Yeah, definitely. Right. So that can be, that can be how, one of the ways the superego shows up. Right. Okay. It shows up with a kind of sense of judgment. So there you are, you're in pain, there's something kind of painful going on there, right? And there's the pain, plus there's this extra layer, right? Which is going, oh, you shouldn't be going there, don't go there, that's not a good idea, right? Mm -hmm. Rather get away from that. But it is interesting, Caroline, that as you talk about your, that voice of that superego, right? As you express that, right? It has a particular flavor to it, right? And so if that voice has the effect on you of making you feel like you want to get away from your experience, right? So in other words, if it is, if it acts as a kind of judgmental, don't go there, you better get away from there kind of thing, right? Then it is acting as, then it is effectively the superego. Okay. If on the other hand, you were to explore you get into conversation with that voice, right? And it's going, oh, you know, honey, I'm just looking after you here. And you, you know, you, you might discover more as you dig into it, right? So there's kind of more to, there's lots to dig into there. And we were talking about this a little bit in the, in the break. At some point you might begin to recognize, oh yeah, that's still my superego, still feels like it makes me feel bad and I have to get away from the experience. But at some point, you might recognize it's not exactly doing that anymore. <laughs> so it is quite a subtle distinction. Yeah. I think the other point that came out in the, we were talking a bit earlier, just to really make it clear, is the presence of the superego is always like a little extra onto whatever it is you're experiencing. So there's pain, and then there's like feeling judged because there's pain. Okay. Or you might be feeling deficient, and then there's feeling deficient about it. Or you might, I mean, feeling judged about it. Or you might be feeling aggressive, right? 
and feeling judged about it. So the judgment could be there or not. It's like a little extra thing that's layered into the experience that makes it fraught, makes it difficult to simply be with. It's because you feel judged about it. Okay, right. all right, great, thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Yeah, Bruce, go ahead. Oh, um, unmute myself here. Yeah, yeah uh, so um, it sounded like the person I was inquiring with had a somewhat similar confusion, which is what you're beginning to illuminate, that I think in my case, I have a rejecting object relationship where um, I, I swallowed down some parental judgments, uh, which actually concern the red and, and, and my strength. And I know with my partner, it's very easy if she might say something well-meaning, but which hooks me, like she might say I should take magnesium or something, and then I'm basically confused as what, if anything, I should take to protect my health. And it, it's so easy. It, it's quite difficult to own the red enough to have a mature response. It's like the red is already backed up in a corner. So I, I, it, the tendency is to either explode or shut the red down. Uh, and, and there are moments when it's like I, I feel a wave of the red in my chest. And, and then, you know, I can begin to see the promise of the red, that there's a strength in it. It's the engine of differentiation. Uh -huh, but, yeah. So, but it, it's that moment. The question is, Bruce, as, as that is happening, are you okay for that to be happening? Are you okay to be with that and to be exploring it? <laughs> it's quite good just to be totally honest about this in, in, in public because I, I think a lot of the time I'm not I I I I I think I okay yeah so I suppose if, if I get really aerated and I shout at my partner I do feel shame um uh -huh. shame of what the neighbors might think of me and I suppose that that is a, a slightly more sophisticated version of a superego that's a kind of judgment for sure I mean there is something about learning to contain these kind of energies and all of that as well right so what's needed then of course is, is some is inquiry right so to have space to be able to explore the aggression right, to let the aggression come out and explore it in a useful way, preferably away from the actual live situation, hmm. right, so that you can explore it. And then there won't be need for the superego to come in and make you feel bad about it, hmm. right? So that's what's good, the good example, the, what's good an example for everyone, what you're saying in there is it points to how important it is to open things, these things up and make space to be able to inquire into them. Because if you just think, oh, well, every time that comes up, that's my superego and I'm not supposed to, you know, sort of do anything with it, that will keep the, the experience kind of closed. Whereas actually what's needed is a lot more inquiry, like into that aggression, into that response, so that you can sort of get to the bottom of it. Yes. I well, I, I think that's been true of me that I, I have just it's one of the very few bits of the diamond approach that's never seemed to work for me. And I, 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 I it's taken me a long time to see, uh, I, you know, how much, how much, how reliant I am on the sort of merge support, which yes, is part right. of the object relationship. So, exactly. I, and at know, that point, you're not really dealing with the superego anymore. You're really into some kind of core structure, right? And then you've got to work with that. It, 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 I, I, you know, I don't, I don't suppose you're in a position to do this, but it, it, it seems like it's a very common confusion amongst Diamond Approach students, which could be more widely addressed, really. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, anyway, that's what thank I'm you. Talking about it. Yeah, you're welcome. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, Umtracht. Try. I see a lot of hands. We'll try and get to everyone. Uh, yes, Dom, I've got a totally different question. Um, I've got a friend who claims she has got no inner critic. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? <laughs> you know, it I think, yeah, it's passes. an interesting, yeah, I've, I know people who have said that, right? I, I, I've had students who've said the same thing. And what I've noticed is that it, it's something that they began to become aware of in a different way, but at, like at some point down the line, 
right? So I think there are some ego structures that, um, you know, can make it seem like there is no inner critic, right? They can, it can seem like that. I don't think it's true that there isn't, but I think that, you know, we don't have to go looking for something if it's not showing up, mm. right? So what they need to do is just go keep exploring what's actually there, right? What shows up and in time, something will begin to reveal itself. I know in the instance I'm thinking of, you know, it was after many years, the person began to see, okay, that thing that's happening there, that's actually, there my inner critic is getting active, right? But it's, um, it took a long time in that particular person's process to become a parent. And that's fine. That's totally fine. Yeah. And yeah. She, she also has like, when I asked, as I said, I was angry the other day and did this in the garden to get rid of, and, and, and I asked her what, what she does. And she said, I can't remember when I was last angry. Uh huh. Yeah, interesting. Right. I, I, I was puzzled. Puzzled. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. we, you know, inquiries and that is all about inner yeah. critics a lot but of. There, there, is there somebody who does a lot of inner work? Or, no, or... none whatsoever. Oh, well. I mean, that can also be it, right? So that at that point, we're not even really aware of these things. I mean, I remember for myself, <laughs> when I first started doing the Diamond Approach, I remember when we first did a weekend on hatred, and I was like, hatred, me, I don't hate anyone, I don't have any hatred in me. Well, goodness, was I wrong about that. But if you asked me kind of in the run up to it, before I discovered it, I would have said I don't have any, I couldn't remember if I'd ever hated anyone. So, you know, I think that's pretty normal, really. It's only once we got, start going digging around in there that we start finding all these things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, okay. and in a sense, that's what then activates the inner critic, right? So you, you're not aware of your inner critic because it's just doing, doing such a good job at keeping all that <laughs> out of consciousness. So, you know, you don't feel judged because you just don't feel those bad things. And it's as you do the inquiry and suddenly all those things start bubbling into your consciousness, then you begin to notice you're in a critic. Yeah. She's not seeing a therapist and she's fine. Every time I see her, she's, she's fine. And I Lucky think, her. Oh, Pardon? <laughs> Lucky her, yeah. And I think, and there's me doing all this exploration. And uh -huh. she doesn't do any, and she's fine. No critic, no anger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you reckon it's right. un unconsciousness? Yeah. Yeah, possibly. Okay. Good job. Thanks for your question. Thank yeah. you. Welcome. Good to see you. Okay. Um, my question is: uh, Can you have the inner critic? and uh, rejecting object relation walking together because I feel I'm stuck on uh, both of them at the moment and it's yeah. it's really painful yeah right so your experience is in fact yes that is the case oh yeah 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 so I, I think that can be and you know the way they kind of operate together you know you can be feeling kind of small and rejected or you know kind of on the small side or on the hateful rejecting side so you could be on either side of it and there can be the additional layer of feeling judged about it right so yeah. there the superego the inner critic is that extra layer right so i'm feeling small and like rejected like ever look around the room nobody wants me everybody everybody's rejecting me, then I'm in that object relation, right? And then I'm like feeling bad about the fact that I'm feeling like that, like what the hell's wrong with you? Why, is, do, why are you still feeling mm. like that? You should be over that or, you know, or if you're feeling the hatred, right? You're feeling hatred and rejection and then your inner critic gets on your case. Like, how can you be feeling that that's bad? All those kind of things. So that's, for sure. That's exactly how I feel. Thank you. Yeah, good. So then it's really important, okay, it's like really important to recognize the inner critic piece of it. The fact that there's an experience that's going on and then there's a judgment layered on top of it, right? And to, 
you know, to, to work with that. Yeah, because yeah. that's just so, making well, me feel kind of small and tight and quiet, really. Right, right. It, on top of already feeling the okay. smallness and pain of the, of the actual state itself. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you, Dominic. Yeah, great, Kay, you're very welcome. Thanks for the question. And Ashok. Hi, Dom. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, so um, this territory is quite confusing for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I don't know if I got I actually got a bit more clarity just hearing, just stepping back from it and hearing the Q&C. But mm -hmm. so I have a lot of common experience of feeling deficient. Mm -hmm. And maybe, uh, and I, I take that to be super ego. You know, um, I don't like feeling deficient, but I often, but maybe I don't actually, what's just now occurring to me in the last few seconds is maybe I don't actually feel the deficiency so that I go in, often into action. I do stuff to yeah. pick myself up, to, you know, to run away, possibly okay. run yes. away from those feelings. Yes. But I think it's all super ego. Right. But I, but I think it's, I think I'm pretty sure it's all super ego, but I okay. kind of, uh, I don't see it as a, as an object relation. Exactly. So I would say to you, it is near certain, I can't say it for certain, but I would, if I were a betting man, I would say it is not all superego, right? The superego, like, how can I say it? It's not a question of where there's smoke, there's fire, but in a certain way, like the superego, the superego is, let's just mute. The superego is a little bit like the smoke, right? But it's not the fire. Right, the fire is something going on. The superego is, it's always a secondary reaction. It is always a reaction to something going on underneath it, right, that it's responding to. So it is judging you for something, right? The superego is the bits that's saying, oh, you're useless, how can you be whatever? How is this showing up in your experience? Or what's wrong with you that this is happening? And it's true, that'll make you feel shitty, right? That can make you feel deficient. But if you can differentiate between, gosh, I feel like I'm deficient and I just don't have it. I just don't have what it takes. As opposed to, and I can feel that, that feels horrible, but I can let myself feel it and it feels okay to feel deficient. As opposed to I'm judging myself for feeling deficient. Right. Yes, yeah, so what you're saying would imply that it's not superego. Yeah. But I do think it feels like to me it's just a continual pernicious. Right. Well, they can, what I'm saying, there could be, right? So the if there is judgment of it, so you're feeling deficient, let me ask you, how do you feel about feeling deficient? Um, uh, I guess I feel ashamed of feeling deficient. Right. Okay. So yeah. then there is indeed, a, there's likely to be a layer of judgment around the feeling of deficiency. Right. So it's probably, maybe, maybe not, but the most useful thing would be to get into a gestalt with it. That's really, in a sense, what you need to do, because it is in the gestalt with the, whether it's the superego or anything else, that you will actually discover what it is. That, as far as I can tell, that's the most powerful way um, to work with it, to find mean, out if there is judgment or if there's just a feeling of deficiency. You mean an, an, an overarching feeling of deficiency in itself would then, you, if it wasn't Subrega, you were saying it would be? Oh, I mean, there are many experiences of deficiency, right? You're just the, the, the kind of main, like feeling of deficiency itself. You feel empty, like emptiness, any hole any hole that we begin to experience, as it starts off, you feel deficient, right? That's, that's a given. And especially, you know, the work that your group is doing with right now is the kind of deficiency at the center of the identity. So it's going to feel like a totally global kind of deficient, like I am deficient in some completely fundamental all the way through kind of way, right? But that's not superego. The superego might, might jump on your case about it, but the core feeling of deficiency itself is not, is not, in a sense, it is what gives the superego purchase, but it's not actually, it isn't the superego itself. 
But my yes. feeling that deficiency predate the group work by a long time. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So no, that is definitely, so it will be good to kind of explore it, to see, is there superego? Because if there's superego compounding it, you want to be able to get, you know, to get that off your case so that you can then just sit with the, the deficiency itself. Yeah. Okay. yeah I mean, I think it is, it's confusing territory. I think it's space that everyone has to work out for themselves and, you know, just give yourself time to inquire with. And, yeah, because it's extra confusing. Uh, and one other aspect of it that's confusing is because the diamond approach often says, stay with your feelings, except yeah. if it's a super. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of have a slightly different view on that. So I think that it is most useful. It's a little bit what I said that you stay with the superego too, but be conscious of how it's affecting you. And the more you feel how it's affecting you and the more you recognize that that is coming from this other force, the more the natural inclination to go fuck off will actually show up and that's what's needed, right? So we do need our aggression to push it away, but not as a contrivance. In a sense, it has to arrive just as part of the truth. Like you're really true, you're just going, well, I'm sitting here, there's this message that I shouldn't be experiencing what I'm experiencing and it's making me feel cuck and I actually just want it to stop, right? Then you are, then your your natural strength is arising to deal with the superego. It's part of the natural unfolding then. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you. Good. Yeah, stay with it. One more. Um, Malcolm. Uh, so you're still on mute there, I think. So I am. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious that we're very short on time here. And interesting, yep. uh, Ashok kind of asks a lot of the questions I was going to ask you, just kind of rephrasing it in my own sort of range of vocabulary. Um, so I've had self-esteem issues for as long as I can remember. They manifest in like, I'm embarrassed to see myself in a mirror and in photographs and things like that. Yeah. And so I was wondering if the superego ever kind of can put its tentacles into the ego structures lying underneath that. Because on the one hand, these feelings of lack of self-esteem seem to want to keep me where I am because they feel kind of ashamed about it, but it also feels comfortable. Like, yeah, I know this place. Like I feel at home here. Yeah. And I was just right. wondering whether the super ego and it's the self-esteem stuff is also kind of reflexive. You know, I just, uh -huh. I just feel that way when there's a trigger, I, there's no conscious process of, of processing that. Right. I was yes. just wondering whether, you know, the ego really can get into those substructures so that um, there's can, kind of a conspiracy. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think there is. I think they kind of shade into one another, right? So it kind of start out looking a superego, like you feel judging yourself because you're, you know, because of whatever, right? So you see your reflection and they, you hear some kind of judgment, right? So some kind of judgment about it. But if you... So you can notice the judgment and kind of identify with the judgment. But if you keep exploring that, at some point, that's going to get you to like, oh, so I feel kind of, so what is it that's making me feel all that shame and that, um, that sort of, you know, like, like the kind of worthlessness? And that actually will reveal an object relation, right? So there's some sense of some other, right, that's basically rejecting you and making you feel bad, like making you feel like what you are is bad or not good enough or not valuable or something like that. And that's where it's kind of a little bit like you said, you've kind of shaded down from the, the superego layer, right, which might make you feel, mm -hmm. oh, this is terrible, I shouldn't be having this experience. If it's possible for you to go, oh, wow, okay, so I feel really like I feel ashamed and worthless and kind of rejected and you can then get into and explore that experience right okay. then the superego is not keeping you from it I right see. and you, as you say it feels familiar sounds like it's a you know a big part of your ego structure will have that object relation and at some point you will need to really get into and bring that object relation and the way it operates into consciousness it's not something okay. You see, if you keep thinking, oh, I got to keep defending against it and tell it to, you know, kind of go away and leave me alone, you will find at some point it will not really transform. 
right? So you then you got to get curious about what is it that's kind of there that's making it stay there. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's uh, it is subtle, subtle territory. This good. So that brings us to time here. Thank you, everybody, for coming along and joining us. Um, we'll post the recording in, I don't know, a couple of weeks, probably. At some point, it will be up. And um, yeah, as I say, if you enjoyed it, if you have uh, other questions to ask, please feel free to, you know, to sort of, you can post them on the YouTube channel. We'll try and uh, sort of engage with things there as well. And, you know, if you found it useful, feel free to to let people know about this forum too. So we really just want it to be useful to make the most impact it can. So thank you. And until next time, I wish you a fruitful, rich exploration. And good night. If you want to unmute and say goodbye, you can. Thank you, Dom. Thank you, Dom. Thank you, Dom. Thank you, Dom. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. See you next time. Yeah.